Uh, good evening and welcome to Engage. Uh, if you'd like to grab a seat, we're uh, going to begin our uh, evening. Uh, my name is Paul Brown and I'm on staff here. I'd like to welcome you if you, this is your first time or you're, uh, you've been here many, many times. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to our uh, special friends group. Um, they've been uh, serving you tea and coffee tonight and they meet during the week. So we give them a big round of applause. Um, there'll be different opportunities where you can kind of go up and top up with tea and coffee uh, through the service. Um, I'm going to pray and then uh, do some announcements and then we're going to meet Rick kind of thing. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that at the beginning of our night we can come before you. Uh, open our hearts and minds to hear your word and know what you're trying to say to us. And be with Rick as he speaks to us and, and brings us uh, his teaching tonight. So Lord, we pray that you bless us now in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Um, you may see uh, a little uh, sheet. This was handed out this morning. Um, every now and then, uh, session likes to look at service and where people are serving within the congregation. And that helps us kind of plan and foresee where their needs and stuff are. There's a little QR code. If uh, you want to try that on your phone, Alistair, you're more than welcome. Um, you can scan that in, and then that will take you to a website. Now, let me just point out, if you've done this uh, question or already online, it was set up as a quiz, and so you would get marked badly if you didn't answer the questions correctly. That is now subsequently changed, so it's just a survey. Now, it is no longer quiz questions to work out whether you're good at serving or not. Um, but that's really helpful for us to kind of get an idea of where you're serving, who is serving, and, and there's a possibility that some of you may be interested in serving in something else and not, and we would love that. Um, I'm going to invite Rick to come up now. Um, Rick is currently the discipleship coordinator. No, no. finished. He's finished. Um, Rick, tell us about yourself. <laughs> I've known Paul for years and he doesn't, he, he doesn't know who I am, no, only joking. Uh, lovely to be with you tonight. Uh, my name's Rick. I'm just stepping into a new role, hence the confusion. So for the last seven years, I've worked for PCI and I've been the discipleship development officer, so just trying to help develop uh, training and resources for the wider church in the area of discipleship. And just currently, um, I'm transitioning into a new role with the Council for Mission in Ireland um, through PCI, and that's to oversee the work of the Council uh, that helps the church, I suppose, look outwards and think missionally um, right across Ireland. And so that's what I'm d about to do at the minute and kind of in a shadowing role uh, until David Bruce retires at the start of next month and then stepping into his shoes. Okay. Uh, Rick, tell us a little about your, about your own faith journey in terms of um, how you came to faith. Yep, I suppose it depends how long uh, you, you have, but I'm really thankful to grow up in a, 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 ch a, a Christian family and a mum and dad who really, uh, I think, uh, modeled faith to me from a young age and exposed me to the church from a young age. Uh, I think it was, in my t it was later in my teens that I uh, decided to make a decision to follow Jesus for myself, but I I'm not aware of a time in my life where I wasn't aware of Jesus. There was plenty of times where I didn't reflect him, let's just say, in my teenage years, um, but uh, grew up through the church. Um, that was in, in Muckamore Presbyterian, just out near Antrim or Dunadry direction. Um, and then really that took me on a journey really of, of hunger and, and and desiring to serve God. And so it took me to Belfast Bible College where I studied and then into a full-time ministry. I spent about a decade in youth ministry, some of that time with Scripture Union, some of that time then with Corn Money Presbyterian as their youth worker. And, uh, and we still attend Corn Money. I'm an elder there um, as well uh, as I moved into the PCI roles up. That's good. Yeah, um, tell us about, a little bit about uh, your family. Can I? Yep, sure. So married to Sarah. Sarah's a teacher. She's a special needs teacher. Um, and then we have three little kids. So Noah's nine, uh, Micah is five, and Anna is my favorite. Uh, sorry, uh, Anna's, Anna's five months. So she's just come along uh, over this, uh, just before the summer as well. So that, that's all. Um, in terms of uh, busy job, busy family life, what do you do to kind of relax, rewind, kind of yep. like that? Okay, love sport, uh, sport of any kind, uh, love to run, so that's one of the, my favourite things uh, to do and kind of clear the head and, and, and all of that, so that's, yeah, a bit about me. Love to read as well. Okay, um, is there anything we can pray for you um, as yeah. a church? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I genuinely appreciate prayer as a 
step into this role. Uh, if I'm really honest about it, I feel daunted by it. I have a lot to learn in it and for it. And so I appreciate prayer that uh, just God would guide me in this and give me wisdom. And, uh, and, and then I suppose you've hinted, Paul, at the kind of busy family life too. And just to, to find that balance, um, some, some weeks I feel I get it right and some feel, weeks I feel I get it wrong. So just a balance of, of uh, family and being a good husband and a good dad as well um, in the midst of that. Okay. Look, let's take some time to pray before you speak. Um, Emily Fowler, we give you thanks for Rick. We give you thanks for his passion for the gospel, for his willingness to serve within our denomination, and the, the way that you have shaped him uh, from a young man uh, to now. Lord, we pray that as he steps into this new role, that you would guide and direct him, that you would give him discernment and wisdom to know what to do and how to do it. And we pray that you would surround him, Lord, with people who are there to support him and to champion him and to see him succeed. So, Lord, we pray that you would just bless him. Let your spirit dwell upon him. Let your word enrich his life and guide and uh, direct his paths. In Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Paul. Um, Jenny, I love you to be, be with you tonight. I was, I was in Romania a couple of weeks ago, and uh, whenever I spoke at a conference there, I noticed that everyone in the church filled up the, the seats from the back, and I thought it's just like home. And uh, as, I, as I stand here tonight, some of you feel quite far away, but uh, hopefully this will be useful to us as we go through. Tonight we're going to explore the theme of resi resilient discipleship, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, and as we go through the night, hopefully that will become a little clearer. As I look across the church tonight, there are many people who could speak and teach on this theme of resilient faith much better than I can, but over the past couple of years, I've been putting together some of these thoughts in the form, uh, in writing and in the form of a book um, called Deep Roots of Resilient Disciples. And really what I'm doing tonight is cheating a little bit and just trying to give a bit of a summary or synopsis of what that is. Um, really for me, some of these ideas w were, were formed and shaped around a picture. The, uh, uh, and I mentioned earlier on I loved to run. And as I was running a couple of years ago through a forest, it was actually right at the start of the COVID-19 lockdowns. And you know when you were allowed out for one hour a day for your daily exercise, or I don't know if that was the rule or not, but you were allowed out the exercise anyway. I was taking my opportunity to run in a local forest. And I remember being uh, running through um, what was once a dense forest and just coming across this completely barren space that used to be full of hundreds and hundreds of trees. And uh, these trees had been cut down, they'd been deliberately removed or deforested for whatever reason. Um, but what caught my attention most wasn't this barren, wide open space, but what caught my attention most was that right next to the, these trees was a, was, was a row of trees that seemed to have fallen down all by themselves. So they were in, in the next for, sort of set of trees along, and they seemed to have fallen down all by themselves. And as I ran on that day, I began to think to myself, was it just a coincidence? Was it just a coincidence that these trees that had stood for decades probably had fallen down at the exact same time as those that had been cut down deliberately beside them? Or was it that these trees had been sheltered for years by these other trees around them, and maybe they'd never really developed enough strength of their own. And when they were stripped away, they found that they weren't strong enough to survive on their own. Was it an issue of poor preparation for these trees? Or was it that they'd been um, strengthened when standing alongside a group of other trees, and they'd received nutrients from the roots and protection from the wind from the other branches. But when those things were removed, they found themselves exposed to the elements with little protection. Was it the issue of isolation in tough conditions? These two questions caught me. The problem of poor preparation, perhaps, or the danger of isolation in tough conditions? And for me, these fallen trees became like a metaphor for both the conditions that we were walking through and the challenges of a pandemic and being isolated from church community like never before, perhaps, as well as the new kind of cultural uh, dimension that we find ourselves in as we move rapidly into a post-Christian context and society. It's a time, or it has been maybe a time of exposure where many people drifted, have drifted to the fringes of fellowship. Maybe in cultural challenges, it's been a time where some floundered 
in their faith. Maybe the shifting of Christianity from being a dominant worldview, perhaps, has now left us exposed and unwilling or unable to stand alone. And in that, maybe disciples of Jesus can be tempted to subtly replace kind of things that they had built their foundations on before, but the root systems begin to crumble as some disciples choose the path of compromise or consumerism instead of cost and challenge. And then, like Paul, as someone who had spent not as long as him, but a bit of time in youth ministry, I began to look around at many of those that I had led, even, to be honest, peers who I had served with. And as I looked around, I began to see many of them who had maybe chosen to replace the habit of church engagement or or even leave their faith behind altogether. For me, this picture crystallized in the need for all of us, no matter what our age or stage, to not just be disciples who follow Jesus, but actually to grow a robustness and a resilience that will enable us to stand firm on Jesus Christ, no matter what storms come our way. A recent book called Faith for Exiles revealed that the percentage of young adults who drop out of the church in the United States of America had increased to 64%. This was research done by the Barna Organization, the kind of largest Christian research group in the world. And they um, interviewed and surveyed literally tens of thousands of American Christians. And that stat is almost two-thirds, two-thirds of 18 to 29-year-olds who grew up and were active in the church as a child or as a teen, had withdrawn from church involvement as an adult. Now, I know you could say those statistics are for the U.S. of A., but if I'm honest, I don't see that much that convinces me that we don't have a similar problem here. The image of the fallen trees rings true for me. See, for some Christians, their spiritual life maybe has been reliant on being spoon-fed answers from the front or being motivated through programs or events or experiences. And maybe our experiences of recent years, whether through conditions of COVID or whether through cultural pressures, has revealed the critical need to teach disciples how to feed themselves and to stand firm in Jesus. The book I referred to points to a subsection of Christians because it's not all bad news, okay? A subsection of Christians whose faith hadn't wilted under cultural pressure or been destroyed through testing or trial, but had actually flourished. And Barna's research suggested that this group represented 10% of Christians, not 10% of the population, by the way, but 10% of believers. And to this group, not the prodigals, who had, been, uh, who had once been Christians and, and were walking away, not the habitual churchgoers who did it out of cultural habit, not the nomads that they called who were lapsed Christians, but this group of 10%, they gave the term resilient disciples. And I loved that term and I grabbed it, so I didn't make up the term. I grabbed hold of what they had done. And they, this is what they described resilient disciples as. They give them four marks. As Christians who attend, now you might want to argue about this, but this is how they they define them. Christians who attend church at least monthly, you might say that's a low bar, okay, but there's what they said, and engage with their church more than just attending worship services, okay? So it wasn't just turn up, okay, but it was be involved. Um, Secondly, trust firmly in the authority of the Bible as God's word given to us. Thirdly, are committed, people who are committed to Jesus personally and affirm that he was crucified and raised from the dead to conquer sin and death. And fourthly, that they express some kind of desire to transform the broader society as an outcome of their faith, that they want to make a difference in the world for Jesus and his kingdom. Maybe you might want to reflect on that list for a moment. Does that describe you? I'm guessing if you're here tonight, It it will describe many of you. Um, If it does, there's a good chance you will be a resilient disciple right now, certainly in Barna's um, estimations. Resilience 
Resilience is, is described as the ability to adjust to or recover readily from adversity. And there's something about preparing for difficulty before it reaches us. There's something that strikes me in the parable of, um, the famous parable of the wise and the foolish builders. Something that strikes me that I hadn't noticed before. Now the Bible scholars among us will roll their eyes at me and say, how didn't you discover this before? But I think as a child or as a teenager, I had formed a picture in my mind of what this parable really, um, uh, what happened in this parable. In my mind, I had this really wise and thoughtful and clever builder, and then this really, really silly person. And the wise person built this incredibly strong house. They were this master builder. And so they created this amazing architecture and reinforced you know, materials, and they built this impregnable house. And because they were so wise, the house was incredible. And so whenever storms came, it wasn't gonna blow away that house. And then I had this really foolish guy in my head, and because he had built in a really, really silly place, then, and because he built on the shore, then the shore, being in the shore, you were going to be more prone to uh, storms and wind, and because he built in a really silly place, then the storms that would inevitably come came and swept away his house. Until I was rereading the parable a couple of years ago, and I realized something that in the description of what the builders built, there was absolutely no difference. You can go to the parable yourself and check. There is no difference in the description of the house that was built by the wise man and the foolish man. The only difference is what the builder built on. <laughs> you see, it wasn't Put your life and put your trust in Jesus and everything's gonna be okay and you won't get any storms. It's that storms are inevitable. Trials come. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. And so um, trials aren't possibilities, they're promises from Jesus. And so when they come, we need to ensure not that we haven't built, built a really impressive faith or life, but that what we have built on will last forever. And in that parable, we're told that the only thing that will last forever is the rock, and we know that the rock that we build our lives on is Jesus. And so resilience is building our lives in Jesus, but it's also preparing and being prepared for difficulty and adversity that comes our way. Resilience is about persevering, it's not something that's automatically achieved. But in the case of children, if there's something that we want them to grow and develop in, we understand that we challenge our children to grow something that we want them to attain. In the case of building fitness, if you wanted to get fit tonight, uh, well, it might not happen tonight, and that's maybe the point. If you wanted to get fit, simply doing one workout or two workouts this week isn't going to be enough. Fitness is going to grow over time through commitment and perseverance over time. And so building resilience is not is about growing and learning to adapt and adjust and persevere through the trials that come our way with the understanding that it's not going to be easy. And that's why the writer of the Hebrews said, run with perseverance, the race marked out for you. Because the writer of the Hebrew understood that it wasn't gonna be easy. If you need perseverance, that's the clue. It's not gonna be easy. Run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So how will resilience grow and develop? It'll grow by building our lives on the firm foundation of Jesus and by fixing our eyes on him and persevering along the way and also then growing through the different challenges that come our way in the midst of faith. And that's a problem. Why is it a problem? It's a problem in a culture that celebrates the instant and looks for the quick success and looks for something that we can just grab off a shelf to add to our life or to our faith but actually where resilience is built up over time as we continue to seek to follow Jesus. Uh, what I'm gonna to do tonight is I'm gonna to share five principles, okay? Um, 
we'll, we'll kind of fly through them at a, a bit of a bird's eye view. So this is not a, an in-depth sweep. Some of these you'll nod your head at very, uh, and some of you will think, I mean, is this it? This isn't rocket science, okay? But actually five of these, I'm going to share five principles. There's 11 in the book, okay? But we're going to pick out five tonight. And, uh, and, and I think these are practices that whenever applied in our life, that actually resilience develops and grows over time. But just before I do, I just want you to maybe respond and react. I've been told that engage is meant to be interactive. Um, and that means the good news is that you don't just listen to the person who's at the front, but you learn and are encouraged by one another as well. So I don't know if there's a couple of questions maybe to come up on the screen. We'll do this twice tonight, once now and once when I'm, when I'm done. But I'd just love you to react maybe to that image, that picture. Do, do you see what I have seen, I suppose, and what I've been articulating? What resonates? with you about the need for resilience in either difficulty or in cultural pressures? And then what does growing in spiritual resilience look like for you? Before I attempt to give you any answers, what does it look like for you? What do you think is key as well? Just, just respond or chat to the people around you, maybe in your pews, permission to turn around or to interact with others, just for two or three minutes, so just react, and then I'll interrupt you in a few moments. Okay. S -s -s so that's your first, that's your first chat tonight. Uh, I knew the problem wouldn't be to get you started talking, it would be to get you stopped talking, that might be the issue. So um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, l let, me, let me fire through five things, five principles uh, that I think are key. As I say, there are others that are, that are there too. You might add others to the list as well. Um, actually, there is a chapter on kind of facing challenges and, and suffering. Uh, I'm not gonna touch on that tonight, but that's, uh, I was sort of hinting at that in, in the parable as well, and, and I think that's a key one. But he, here's five that we'll talk about, uh, and then I want you to react to them later on, either in your discussion with each other or through questions. I think there's opportunity for questions as well. And um, yeah, I'll try and answer them, but we'll see. Uh, so the first one is embrace the cost, okay? Embrace the cost. I think we need um, an underpinning of resilient discipleship is to understand that there is going to be and there will be a cost, could be a cost in all sorts of different ways, by the way, but Christianity comes with a cost. And Explorer Ernest Shackleton's story goes that Explorer Ernest Shackleton ran an advertisement in the newspaper in 1914 to recruit a crew for his endurance expedition in, in Antarctica. And uh, rather than outline all the benefits, this is what he chose to write. He went for brute honesty. It says this, men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in event of success. Now who would sign up for that? Sounds like a great holiday. It sounds like a good mission trip, doesn't it? You know, come and there's going to be a hoodie and you're going to meet lots of friends. You're going to have a great time and there's going to be amazing food and you'll get some photos for your Instagram, right? Yeah? No, none of that. He made the cost clear at the outset and it attracted 5,000 applicants. <laughs> but because he was, he was clear about what he was calling people to, he emphasized the dangers and the difficulties that lay ahead to help prepare his crew for what would happen whenever they got there. Because if he'd asked them to sign up to a holiday camp and they arrived and they saw the conditions they would duck out of the first sign of trouble, right? That's not, that's not what you promised us. That's not what I signed up to. I deserve better than this. But he was outlining the, uh, he was outlining the cost at the start. In some ways, Jesus was no different. And sometimes when I read the Gospels, it almost feels like Jesus was trying to put people off. <laughs> you want to follow me? See all your possessions? Go and sell them? and then come back. <laughs> you you, you want to be my follower? See your family and friends? You need to forsake them, and then come follow me. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. His approach isn't really an advertiser's dream. I kind of imagine a PR company sidling up next to Jesus saying, Jesus, we need to really work on your message here. You know, it's not really going to draw people in. You're going to put some people off. Then why is it that so often I choose to emphasize all the benefits and yet downplay the, the challenges when I share the gospel with others? You see, discipleship comes with a cost. 
True discipleship is not convenient, it's not comfortable, but it confronts consumerism, it challenges comfort, and it emphasizes cost. You know, I believe that comfort is one of the biggest obstacles to faith. Not militant atheism, not aggressive secularism, but becoming comfortable. Faith erodes when we choose to downplay trouble and avoid cost. In fact, the more we learn to suffer and embrace the cost of our faith, the more we will be prepared to sacrifice and to serve. And actually, knowing that helps us to prepare for it when it comes. Discipleship built in comfort and consumerism can attract the crowd in a short term. But actually, I think it leads to a short-term response over depth down the line. It might gain traction, but it causes people to duck out at the first sign of discomfort. In Ocean's Eleven, Danny Ocean, George Clooney, gathers a group of thieves and robbers around a swimming pool, and he tells them this. He tells them his plan. He says, what I'm about to propose to you is both highly lucrative, sounds good, doesn't it? And highly dangerous. In other words, we're going to make millions but actually it might cost us our freedom or we might die. Do you see what he was doing? Outlining the benefits, but warning of the cost. Billy Graham said it better than Danny Ocean. He said, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything you have. And a youth leader recently told me about an experience that she had of sharing the gospel with a group of teenage girls on a summer camp. And these girls, the girls in her small group, had been really moved by the presentation of the gospel. And she said then that she was really excited to gather with them in their small group that night and to talk about it. And some in the group responded to receive Jesus for the first time, and she was thrilled. But then she said that, she went, that others in the group went on to acknowledge that they weren't willing yet or ready yet to count the cost for whenever they went back home. And while she was really discouraged, it struck me that there must have been something in the way she presented the gospel to them that must have included some kind of challenge to sacrifice something. Otherwise, I don't think they would have rejected it in that way. And that can discourage us in the moment, but including some kind of challenge to sacrifice as we share and disciple others and teach others, I think is going to help more in the long haul. It's why those exposed to persecution often display some of the most vibrant of faith, because they've counted the cost, they've grown through discomfort, the conditions have actually enabled growth. And that's why actually as believers, I don't believe that we should fear being part of a post-Christian culture. Sure, there'll be some things that we might um, find difficult. Sure, there are, there are going to be challenges along the way. But I wonder actually if the church might actually find a new form of renewal as we learn to, to, to live among the challenges that come with a post-Christian culture. The conditions might enable a new form of growth. So, to grow in our resilience when it comes to faith, I think we need to be prepared to not just embrace it, but understand the cost and then embrace it. Secondly, I want to suggest that the second marker, another marker of resilient discipleship, is a, is a commitment to Christian community. Now, I deliberately haven't just said attending church, okay? We'll get to that in a moment. But actually committing to Christian community. And we need to see that Christianity is not a solo sport, but that following Jesus means embracing his bride. See, running, I mentioned earlier, is my sport. And you see, whenever something I've discovered about running is that whenever I run with others, it causes me to run further and run faster. Now, that's just strange. You might say, why is that? But it's maybe my pride and ego. I don't want to get left behind or I don't want to be, appear to be slower than the people around me. But there's something about running with others that 
you know, keeps me, I'm in a group and I, and I want to keep on the heels of the person in front of me. Or maybe as I run along with someone else, we can chat and, the, you know, that the time just goes by quicker. But whenever I run on my own, I'm tempted to take a shortcut. Or whenever I get tired, I think I'll just turn now and go home or I'll drop the pace. Running with others helps us to run further and run faster. Now, I believe the same is true for following Jesus. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day, as you see the day approaching. And it feels like these words are even more important in a post-COVID world. We, you know, we'll learn to treat discipleship as a kind of digital download. Maybe we'll learn to engage with church from the comfort of our sofas are the safety of a screen, but we can't do discipleship without the body of Christ. We desperately need to engage with and grow with other Christians in a way that pushes us beyond the surface. You know, something, something happened to me on a Sunday recently where I looked across our church to see someone whose life has recently been turned upside down through a difficult diagnosis. And they were, there they were during the songs, worshiping God with all of their heart. And it moved me to worship. I can't get that on my own. <laughs> I can't get that at home. Or when I meet other believers in our home group, my faith is strengthened whenever I hear how God is moving in someone else's life or working in someone else's heart. And I can't get that on my own. Spiritual growth requires genuine and authentic and experienced Christian community where we see how someone responds to God in the midst of trial or where we see prayer modeled to us by someone else or where we can admit weakness and vulnerability and where we can take off the mask and say that we are struggling and when people can minister to us, Christian community where we can talk about the implications of this Bible passage and what that means to us as we go to work tomorrow or where we learn from the wisdom and the insights of older believers around us or more mature believers. And it takes intentionality, intentionality in sharing our lives and showing up week by week and in inviting people in and praying for others. And you know, as we do that day by day, the weekly habit, the regular habit, it builds resilience little bit by little bit over time. You know, I hinted at it earlier, but in recent years, there have been a growing number of people who have decided that while they still quite like Jesus, maybe they're not that fussed with the church and, you know, and they've chosen to try to do faith on their own. And you know, if I'm honest, at times I get it. I understand why some people have been frustrated or annoyed or walked away, but you know, I don't see any other way to grow as a disciple of Jesus. Let me tell you about David. David is a student in a large, was a student in a large suburban church elsewhere in this city, surrounded by lots of his peers, and he decides to look for a new church. Not all that unfamiliar, you might say, but not because David was dissatisfied with his current church, but because he saw a huge need in a small, almost dying church in a nearby housing estate. So rather than be part of a church with dozens of people his age, he becomes the youngest person in another church by over 20 years. And he begins leading a youth outreach there, and he, begins, and he goes there because he wants to encourage some of the older believers there. It's the exact opposite reason of why people leave church, isn't it? He's committing himself to community even when it's in an inconvenience to him or against his preferences. We need to understand that as we engage with the church, it's not about our preferences, it's about God's purposes. So how can we, more than filling a pew or occupying a pew, how can we commit to Christian community? And that's for those of you who are nodding your head and saying, yes, we need to get people to church and people need to turn up more. I'm wanting to push you and challenge you to say it's more than that. It's that whenever you are there taking an active role, as Hebrews says, to encourage one another, to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. How can you do that as you look across the pews tonight? How could you spur one another on? How could you encourage one another? Pray for one another as you see the day approaching. 
Um, thirdly, keep them going here, uh, living distinctively. Um, I think this is a huge call and challenge for us, and this will require, does require resilience for us to do this in our world. In 2001, a man called Carl Parr stood on the pitch at Old Trafford. I wonder if you've ever heard of him, if you're a Manchester United fan. He's in this team photo here. You might not have heard of him, okay? The reason you've never heard of him is because he's never pro played professional football, and yet he's in that picture. Because in 2001, wearing a Manchester United kit, he, just before a vital Champions League game, he somehow managed to get himself onto the pitch and into the team photo, and there he is on the very left-hand side. Carl Parr continued to do that, okay? It wasn't just there that he did it. He also found his way onto the court, uh, the center court of Wimbledon and warmed up with an opponent before the opponent realized that wasn't his opponent. And also onto the England uh, cricket pitch as a test batsman as well. He's a master at blending in. It's brilliant. And I love what he did, but you know, we're called to do exactly the opposite. We're meant to be among the world and live within the culture, but we're called to be distinct from the culture we inhabit. And Jesus amplifies this in one of his best known prayers. John 17, he says, my prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, that, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. You see, Jesus desired that his followers would be part of the world that they were in, and then that they would be distinct in the way they lived. You see that? They are to be resilient disciples are to be present, part and parcel of the world and the culture, but distinct while they are part and par parcel of it. I think there's three op options open to us. One option is that we escape our culture. Perhaps some things in the culture challenge us and disturb us or even annoy us, and so we're frightened by the impact that it might have on us or even those who are younger in faith. And so we, treat, we retreat and we run away. We feel threatened. We want to build up defensive and protective walls around us, and we try to escape the culture. I once drove past a church, not of our denomination, but they had no windows. <laughs> Uh, they had no windows in their building and they had big massive high gates and kind of fences and I thought, I wonder if they're just trying to keep the sin out. <laughs> well, I had a message for them or I had a news for them because you can't do that. <laughs> we can't just build up protective walls to keep us safe. And it's not overly helpful and it doesn't help us build relationships with the world around us and it's not what Jesus modeled. Then the other temptation is that we embrace the world. You know, the other option is that we could just embrace the world and everything in it, embrace the ideas of our culture, love our culture so much that we should throw ourselves into its ideas and activities or principles. You know, everyone else is embracing that, and I don't want people to think that Christians are boring, and so maybe for, to help them to see that Christians aren't all bad people, then I'll embrace those ideas too. Or everyone else is watching that series in the office and um, and so I don't want to be left out of that conversation, so I'll join in too. Or those opinions are accepted by most people, and you know, the Bible was written in a very different time, and, and you know, so I'll base my opinions on what society says. We can embrace it, but the embrace options doesn't show any courage. And it's not, again, what Jesus modeled. Jesus, who wasn't afraid to say difficult words, to the people around him or the authorities um, around him. He didn't embrace every idea as if it was true or good, but he clearly stated that he was the way to follow instead. And some Christians maybe assume that becoming more like the culture will make us more winsome or attractive, but all it does is serve to dilute our message and to make us so much like the world that the world doesn't see any difference and so doesn't see any need for us. In Tozer's words, worship is no longer worship when it reflects the culture around us. So if we're not the escape and we're not the embrace, what's the other option? The other option is one that engages in the culture as a disciple of Jesus. Where did Jesus tell his followers to shine their light? To shine their light before others so that they may see their good deeds. People will not see our good deeds if we don't shine them in front of others. 
In the words of John Stott, he said, we are neither to seek to preserve our holiness by escaping from the world, nor to sacrifice our holiness by conforming to the world. And so the rubber might hit the road for you tomorrow in the office, in the coffee break, where there's a conversation going on. And the temptation is to escape that conversation. Oh, we Christians shouldn't have any part of that conversation. But what would it look like to engage in the conversation? to be present in that conversation, but seek to bring a distinctive to it. What would that look like? The thing I love, one of the things I love about the ministry of Jesus is that so much of it happened, not in the synagogues, but in the streets. It happened in dusty roads, stony beaches, in gardens and around tables and in empty fishing boats and grassy hillsides. See, Jesus used the everyday settings for him to share his life and to minister to others. Resilient disciples will not embrace the values of the world, but resilient disciples won't seek to embrace the world either. And the best biblical picture I have of this is the story of Daniel and his mates. It grabs my imagination as I watch what God is doing in a culture today. These young men who are carried off into an unfamiliar land. Under an unfamiliar land, under the rule of a king who wants to rob them of their identity and push new customs in their face. And these young men are determined not to eat the food that's offered to them. They, aren't, they, aren't, they don't bow down to the worthless idols. They don't give up the discipline of prayer. But you know, there are some things that they do go along with. You see, they had wisdom. They accept new names. They learn a lot language in the literature of the Babylonians. You see, they had the wisdom to know what to engage in and what not. What would compromise their faith and what actually was just a cultural expression that wouldn't cause them difficulty. We need to learn to carry our faith in a different environment. And you know, if I'm honest, <laughs> this is difficult to do, but sometimes I, I, I want to speak to those who are older tonight as well. Because as I spoke earlier on, there's a temptation to think that this is just all about those who are younger in faith. But you know, as I look at my parents at times, I think they need help grappling with living in a different culture and society than what they have been used to. In some ways, it might actually be harder for an older generation to know how to engage well, but to do so distinctively. Maybe the problem in a younger generation is that we give up our distinctiveness as we engage in the culture. Maybe the problem with an older generation is that we keep our distinctiveness, but we don't engage with the culture. Do you see? How how, how can we do both? And I know this isn't an easy thing. It requires wisdom and discernment. But how can we learn to thrive in exile and be godly in a foreign land? Fourthly, cultivating spiritual habits. Something... I love about the story of Daniel again is that Daniel was probably 80 years of age when he was thrown into the lion's den. That brings a little bit of a different picture to the illustrated children's Bibles, doesn't it, for that picture? But he'd been there for several decades, and this is what it says in chapter 6. When Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. There's something that would be easy to miss in this story. Daniel chose to pray facing towards Jerusalem. Why on earth would he do that? Think about it. Over 50 years after he had left Jerusalem as a teenager, his heart was still focused on turning towards the spiritual formation of his youth. And the rhythm of his life was still orientated around the patterns of temple worship that he had learned as a boy in Jerusalem. He'd lived the majority of his decades in Babylon, and yet the orientation of his heart was still built around the worship of God. What an example, and what resilience. You know, it had been so easy for Daniel to say, the decree had been signed for 30 days. Sure, what's 30 days? I've been at this for 80 years. What's 30 days? I could take 30 days off, couldn't I, after 80 years? But he didn't say that. He ensured his heart would continue to be, um, sorry, his life would be continued to build around 
the spiritual habits of his youth. You know, a challenge, sorry, a way to help us to build resilience is to make sure that we are cultivating spiritual habits and disciplines in our life. Habits of retreat and rest and Sabbath. Habits of Bible reading and engagement with God and prayer. Habits perhaps even of fasting or of uh, generosity as well. Things that, times where we step back and times where we lean in. How can we cultivate spiritual habits? You know, many mornings we've battled with our toddler to help him to eat his breakfast. It's the most frustrating thing, if I'm honest, uh, in our mornings. And without us literally putting the spoon into his mouth whenever he was three, he literally wouldn't have eaten in the morning. But for him to develop and mature, he needs to, we, we can't walk around for the rest of his life. You know, it'll be a bit embarrassing when he's 18 that we're still following him around with a spoon. He needs to learn how to feed himself. And so we've been trying to teach him and coach him a little bit. And so I still sit beside him in the morning and I at times remind him to talk less and eat a little bit more or to get more, less distracted and to pick up a spoon. But I'm not putting the spoon, I'm not holding the spoon for him. He needs to learn how to feed himself and we need to help him do that. To build resilience, we need to go beyond being spoon-fed Christians who expect easy answers and just wait to be fed ourselves by someone else. We need to be actively feeding ourselves, learning to abide in Jesus, embracing spiritual habits, regular rhythms. And for me, it's the image of the iceberg where the strength of the iceberg isn't seen in what's above the surface, but in what's below. What's below the surface of your faith? Is it like that picture? Is the majority of it there? What are we like in the private place or in the silent place? How can we build regular habits? And you know, the culture out there, I believe, is too strong to rely on, I don't know, one sermon a week and a quick five-minute skim in the morning. Fruitfulness requires faithfulness. Regular rhythms. Lastly, I'll do this one quickly. A key element, I think, in spiritual growth is sacrificial service. You know, if our spiritual lives are all about ourselves, then actually, sorry, I'll put it a different way. The best way for us to grow spiritually is not to focus on growing spiritually. The best way for us to grow spiritually is to learn to serve others and to serve God. And as we do that, he begins to teach us and shape us. In Mark 10, we meet two ambitious young disciples. They're desperate to be elevated to prominent positions in the kingdom of God. They say, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left. They're focused on power and position and prestige. But what does Jesus draw their attention to? Not how to climb the ladder, but how to get on their knees. Not how to climb the ladder of the Christian life, but actually to be a servant and to sacrifice. He encourages them to choose a downward trajectory. He teaches them that leadership isn't about being served, but about becoming a servant. You see, the Bible doesn't actually talk loads about leadership. It talks a lot about service. And if we don't have a heart to serve in the background, then maybe we shouldn't really be the ones who lead in the foreground. One of the things that Jesus did with his disciples, first of all, the 12 in Luke 9 and then the 72 in Luke 10, was that he sent them out. He gathered them together in the pairs and then he sent them out on mission. If there was one person who's ever walked the face of the earth who could have completed the mission on his own, it was Jesus. And yet he, used, he gathered his disciples and he sent them out. You see why? Because mission was the training ground for discipleship. For us to grow in our discipleship, we need to engage in mission and we need to engage in serving others. How can we choose to serve others so that it builds a resilience in us? And in a book called Lead, Carl Martin writes this, and I love it. Leader, if you have not done your time lifting chairs, locking up, or cleaning floors, you probably have not grown enough muscle to enable you to do any heavy servant lifting. And if you're beyond cleaning a toilet or washing a floor, you're probably beyond Jesus leadership. How can we serve? How can we serve others? It was interesting you have a survey about that in your church. Maybe that's a, a th just something church is putting before you at the minute, but maybe actually you might want to consider. 
We need to serve within the boundaries and within the community of the church, but we also need to, like the disciples in Luke 9 and 10, engage with mi- in mission in the world out there. How can you find ways to sacrificially serve? So here are the five, okay? These are the five that I think um, I've suggested tonight. Embrace the cost, commit the community, live distinctively, cultivating spiritual habits and sacrificial service. Last little thing. I hinted earlier on, or sorry, I referred earlier on to the parable of the uh, wise and foolish builders. And in the parable of the wise and foolish builders, Jesus tells us what wisdom looks like. Okay, he says that the wisdom is the one who doesn't just hear the words, the word of God, but who puts it into practice. A wise man is one who not just hears the word, but puts it into practice. So my challenge as we finish tonight is that I believe many of you, as you walk here in here tonight and you sat down in the pews and we've thought about these five areas, I reckon most of you could nod your head at most of these. Yeah, that sounds a pretty wise thing. I've probably heard most of those in church before. That sounds like a, a journey, uh, you know, uh, practices or principles for discipleship. But my question tonight, and I ask this to myself too, is are we putting it into practice? Are we living these principles out? Are we stepping into them? Because I believe that through these, resilience grows. As we build our lives in Jesus, and as we fix our eyes in him, we adopt these principles and practices, we grow in resilience. So what I want you to do, just again, around you, I want you to have a chat. But rather than kind of chatting up there in vague principles, I'd love you to talk about what these look like in your life. And particularly, I'd love you to think about, are there one or two of these that really Um, the Holy Spirit might be putting his finger on tonight in your life for the need for you to put into practice, to not just know in your heads, but to live out through your hands and in your heart as well. So have a chat about that, okay? Have a chat maybe about which one strikes you, then maybe chat about what that looks like and what it could look like in your life, and then I'll hand over to Paul. I don't know if there's questions, but I'm happy to answer some or respond to them tonight. But take a few minutes just to respond with the people around you. Good evening again. Um, a uh, good chat, always kind of hard to kind of stop that kind of thing, but we have one question that kind of came in, and I just wanted to uh, ask it to Rick um, kind of consider. Um, to what extent is developing a Christian biblical worldview essential to being a disciple? Uh, I think it is essential and, and vital. Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll balance this first of all, and then I'll, I'll come back to why I think it's important. Uh, I talked just as I finished about uh, knowledge is not just what we know in our heads, it's also how it's lived out and making sure that it's lived out. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think in a world that is very confused about what it believes, I think we have an opportunity as believers. Um, So there's a missional opportunity, I think, to come with clarity. Um, I think God's word provides clarity and, and to be able to say to a confused world, here's clarity. Um, I think it's vital, uh, again, to, to develop a Christian worldview biblical from two perspectives. So one is actually just understanding the Bible as the, as the kind of story of God that it, that it is and helping people to see and, and, and growing in ourselves and our kind of knowledge of the big picture, the big picture story of, of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So that's one. And I suppose if I had more time, I've probably talked about that in the cultivating spiritual habits bit. It's not just about, you know, reading the Bible as a devotional tool. It's part of it. But it's also familiarizing ourselves with that story um, right, right through from Genesis to Revelation. The other thing I would say is actually I, I'm seeing more and more now. In our church, we would have used Alpha as a tool. I know plenty of people use Christianity Explored as a tool as well, as an evangelistic tool. What we're seeing now in our church is as we use those tools, which they are still evangelistic tools. We are seeing them as kind of critical ways for people who come fairly new in the church, but also anyone who doesn't come from a kind of church or, or a Christian kind of worldview background is that they are critical tools now for actually helping people to understand the basics of the Christian faith. And so I think what once were evangelistic tools can also be used as discipleship tools now as well as we become 
as we help to familiarize ourselves with the, the big picture story of, of God and, and the kind of basics of the Christian faith. So very is what I would say, very important. Um, and, and maybe, you know, also very important because sometimes what we in this country have wrapped up as Christianity sometimes isn't always that, sometimes more a cultural um, lens, if that makes sense, or understanding of, of, of what is really there rather than actually helping people to come face to face with the story of God and the kind of, what was the phrase? The Christian, Christian worldview. worldview, yeah, ourselves, so yeah. Um, last question, um, so what would you go back and, and say to yourself as a teen kind of thing? Obviously with some of our young people with us tonight, what would you say to yourself as a teen in terms of how you approach discipleship and what you would want to do differently? This will be like a job interview where I drive home and re- wish that I'd said something, <laughs> something different perhaps. Uh, that's, a, that's a brilliant question. I mean, there's one little example I'd love to, and I don't know if this speaks to parents more or teenagers, but um, when I was 13 or 14, I argued with my mom most Sundays. I did not want to go to church. Particularly Sunday nights, sent the youth group, didn't want to go there. All sorts of arguments, all sorts of excuses. And um, I wasn't given the option. <laughs> wasn't given the choice. If I had made the choice, I would have ducked out long before. But whenever I was 16, on a Sunday night, God has a sense of humor, on a, on a Sunday night when I was 16, I went to an event that I had argued about going to. And it was at that event that God used something that was said from the front and a song to, to I think, change the direction of my my life, or certainly my awareness of it. Um, I would say, don't duck out. Don't duck out. Stay involved. Stay committed. Even when you don't feel like it, stay committed. Um, The other thing I'd say now to myself is be a learner more. So I probably too much as a young Christian, this is maybe less as a teen, maybe more as a young student, early 20s. I thought I knew, I thought I knew more than I did and it didn't wear my L plate with pride. And I think you have an opportunity when you're younger to say, I'm not sure about this, to ask questions, to lean on the wisdom of older believers as well. So to not pretend or walk around that, yeah, pretending that I had it all sorted, but to admit more weakness, show more vulnerability, to rely on God more, to be a learner, and to, yeah, learn from the wisdom and insights of of, of others as well. Thanks, Rick. That's great. Um, We're now going to praise God. We're going to stand collectively together and declare um, who this God is. And and one of the best things about being part of a church community is that our voices all kind of come together in praise of him. So let's stand together and sing.